often wonder how does one hear music inside one's head when one plays? What do we privilege in what we play when we hear it? Do we guide ourselves by the action, by the secondary voice, especially in polyphony? Do we sing it to ourselves? Do we tell it to ourselves in notes, spoken? How do we keep the concentration so that we don't get distracted when voices overlap in order to keep the voicing through the piano playing shadows and lights in a way that is meaningful while beautiful. Very often when I think about it, I think we oppose the fugal writing playing as um, cerebral concentration, organization of thoughts, ways as Bach managed to organize the voice leading such ways that all the voices are harmoniously uh, exchanging with each other, seemingly on their own, while with the beauty of the inner world, of the inner voices, like in Mozart piano quintets or even string quintets with two violas, the beauty of the inner voices highlighting the outer parts, the top and the bottom. I love the idea that in polyphony there is nothing to hide, there's no accompaniment towards the melody, there's no hierarchy that is predefined by the pattern. You're the accompaniment and you're the lead melody. It's, um, it's some kind of an idealized society of equals. Of course, at some point, the concentration to follow a few, two, three, four, five, two, six, or more, nothing but follow in listening intensely with score or without hopefully is possible to detect through the playing of the performer the voicing that brings out the contours of the phrases and these archings of the lines so this architectural beauty becomes emotional while purely um, cerebral and what makes it the one from the other? I find that in some situations it's in the eye of the beholder because ultimately as a genre, the classical fugue, if I call it so, Baroque fugue, is very intimately connected to pure music versus imitation of dance or song on the keyboard harpsichord, fortepiano. It's its own element. Of course, it's vocal for most of the cases when you have longer vowel values or vowels. It's the same. You hear, in fact, in your head when you play instrumental fugue with long values, the vowels or the consonants of imaginary lyrics or words in Latin or in any language. And the idea of the delay decay and the idea of the secondary voices which in fact are not inferior in importance like the contra subject. In fact, they valorize the subject and the answer mirrors the subject. In fact, all the elements are self-generated from that subject and so it gives this impression of a flourishing garden of a blossoming. You start with one and you finish with many who are so alike while in fact mirroring each other, especially if towards the strato you have inversions and uh, retrograde motions and perhaps augmentations or uh, diminutions. But whichever way you treat uh, the 
thematic material in its development, what I find striking is this continuous concentration of the attention, even through the episodes, which are supposed to be the sort of traveling between different exposures of the subject in different tonalities. And um, the art of the quality of the transitions in the performing, I think, is so essential because it brings the sense of grace to the to the form. It's not just utilitarian, as by the formal factor it is. It becomes with portion of the subject that it carries um, through a sequence with canonic imitations or not. It's like an embellished quality of a utilitarian um, corridor that relates and connects to another tonality. Of course, sometimes you don't need to do that because you can modulate by third uh, or you can uh, modulate with another common tone. But uh, if you use this, uh, then it gives a moment of breather from the intensity of the overlapping elements of the answer with the contra subject or the contra subject with the other entrance of the uh, subject. In the different tonalities, if it was relative minor or major, then you have a different outlook. Not that it's happy and sad in Baroque, in my opinion, so much as the romantic era connotation of the modes, but um, it does bring a different aspect, a different colorization to this subject, so that in fact the apparent austerity of uh, the choice of a single subject theme that will be um, generating like um, parthenogenesis, its own um, clones, and therefore um, peopling a whole universe out of one, it's a fascination for humanity, probably, from beginning of times. And um, Mademoiselle Boulanger used to tell me that for the competitions of the Paris Conservatory at the beginning of the 20th century, they gave him a little paper with a subject in front of the jury with five minutes silent, watching it for them, discovering it, but not playing it, to imagine in their head all the combinations they can do out of it in terms of the canonic elements of imitation and all the different aspects that the strato will bring. And then they have to play it right away and preferably on the organ because of course you can even play more polyphony with the two manuals and the pedals. And um, this idea of very doctored improvisation through all these very strict rules makes the fugue something like a predestined path, but within which you still have room for surprise, like for instance a new contra subject, or sometimes like Schubert in the F minor sonata, or Schubert fantasy rather, for two uh, four hands. He starts the fugat of fa mi re do do with the sub contra subject fa sol si la at the same time. But most of the time you expose the contra subject with the answer, not at the get-go with the subject. And then it depends how you organize the entrances of the voices between the high voices and the low voices in the SATB uh, rapport of the soprano, alto, tenor, bass, the lower women voices with the alto and lower bass voices for the men, alternating with the higher voices of the women soprano with the higher voices of the men tenor and more, if you have five or six voices, second tenor, second alto. This fascination for horizontal displaying of materials um, with overlapping phrases that um, in fact seem to go to infinity, it's some kind of a connection towards infinity, uh, is quasi opposite to the pianists approach to a score where you have two staffs, even if you have stems up and down for the different voices within each hand, let's say two and two, at least, or already, at most, sometimes. The, the brain searches for the rationale of how do they fit, and so one plays slices by beads. 
of vertical slices of the cake rather than layer by layer of making the cake when eating it. And I feel like somehow this analogy fits well in the way that we have to sing each voice, play one and sing one. Many of us do that when they practice a fugue because it's a peculiar way of training our hearing before even we can play it, let less if we can copy it by hand in staves, not bunched for the piano two staves, and then eventually from memory as well, to really immerse ourselves, to integrate completely the capacity of the voices to interact with each other and their uh, traction follow-up motion within modulations and all kinds of punctuations so that we enter in the DNA of the thought of the composer how everything follows each other not just because it's there in front of you as it is in the score and you have to play it and then memorize it but by writing it disconnected from the keyboard um, touch therefore um, away from the muscular memory of the fingertips for pianists to really e immerse yourself in the voices in the uh, phrases and take the time by writing it slowly as it takes the time to do um, to be done you appreciate even more some details of uh, phrasing or decoration or difference between the first time and the second time in anticipation a um, possibility of a suspension that in some other cases is a, a poggiatura because it's not tied and then it's restricted to create that tension release and uh, dissonance that consonance while other voices overlap with different agendas at the same time of course the human brain privileges the action versus the reaction I assume not all pianists can uh, sort of absorb in real time all the elements equally I think we privilege them while playing them but when you write them you can't do that because you have to think about the elements on their own. You can sing them, perhaps solfege them if you're comfortable with solfeging. Or just speaking it in rhythm patterns. In other words, manage to bring it uh, on the table in writing, in speaking or perhaps in singing before or in between practicing it for piano playing. So that when you place your fingers on the keyboard then um, somehow your brain guides them where they have to go because you remember the melodic line flow by layers from the writing as if you wrote it yourself literally composed of course not but or why not try to do your own um, contrapoint is complex it looks so simply beautiful and uh, functional when it's written marvelously but when you have to figure it out yourself, you realize that somehow it's a sometimes impossible task. It's another crossword puzzle of a sort, but a little more or differently. And it's fascinating to observe how we all apprehend, comprehend, and approach the learning compared to the playing on the piano for a new score, regardless if it's a polyphonic piece or not in this case. Lipati, in his late um, years, which unfortunately were young, since he died in his mid-30s, 1950, in um, Geneva, where he was teaching in the conservatory, he gave an interview where, on the radio there, um, he says that uh, his only way to learn music, new music, is to um, study it on the table before touching it on the keyboard and memorizing it on the table. Full details, tempi phrasing, articulations, pedaling, everything the edition suggests and everything he understands from the piece, before even trying it on the keyboard, but immediately, as soon as playing it on the keyboard, working on it from memory. It's, it's an interesting uh, concept compared to most of us, if not all of us, we take the score and we start playing it, looking at it, 
and uh, fixing constantly little mistakes, patches here and there. So it takes longer to have the flow when we want the detail. And I think that if we can then on the practicing of the fugue sing or speak one voice and play another, it's already good. If we can do two uh, played and one spoken, it's even better, etc. The etc. being at some point, perhaps beyond three, the pianist starts to verticalize the organization of how the hands synchronize or how they correspond and how things m match. It's inevitable. I don't think it's to be fought. I just find that it's a little bit reductive because you feel like it's a question of patience and time to absorb and, and um, take the time to immerse yourself in the beauty of the voice leadings. All these are very obvious facts I'm stating. Nobody um, can find that very striking. But what I find very striking when I observe students applying it by writing it before playing it is that it gives them another dimension in their development of their pianistic skills because of course we have to put fingerings and phrasings and substitutions galore since we have to hold things and stretch things and the hands don't always hold everything and the pedal is not a solution because it smears the voice leading since its melodic lines are overlapping not harmonic elements like arpeggios that you can redundantly pedal therefore for the clarity and the complexity of the clarity so to say that to be difficult in my choice of words you need to be able to um, to have heard it inside you as if you composed it by having written it. And I find that it does pay off um, in the learning in terms of, um, in my experience of teaching that way, the memory sleep is lesser um, of, um, of a fear in a fugue when you have written it, from memory I mean, after you have copied it from the score already, as a first and then a second step until you don't need the score because you hear the voices in you. You can be driving or cooking or doing any domestic um, things and uh, singing to yourself voice by voice the elements or inside your head even or in the shower or something. And I think that um, this connection to the piece in any uh, form other than only through the keys, when it comes to the keys and you have to apply the fingerings and the phrasings and therefore organizing um, specific ways to share the middle voices between uh, the inner parts of the hand because mainly the two thumbs then you have to really visualize how a middle voice is shared by the two hands to be one single voice whenever the outer parts played by the outer parts of the two hands naturally are separated in that um, sense for the brain but to to um, to take in account equally the layerings of shared hand playing versus individual hand playing while on paper it seems obvious and not very difficult to imagine why since we don't have three four five hands obviously or brains it is an apprenticeship of playing after comprehending after having read and memorized and learn the piece from inside out so to say and when you play it it's out because it's the essence expression from the latin prefix for out compared to impression for in for the expression you have to be able to play it because even if you hear it in your head even if you can sing it and write it and copy it it doesn't mean you can play it either to your desired expression of singing voices legato or if you choose to do different articulations for some voices by contrast not only lights and shadows but therefore texture contrast between non legato legato um, air legato depending of the values if they're quick values or short values uh, with very long values overlapping and around 
every few because it's on different challenge. I mean, we can attribute a character in the interpretation to a fugue in Bach, but most of it is just the pure music itself. Therefore, it can be convincing in different tempi because I don't think it's per se an issue as a character, like in the Liszt Sonata, the Fugato is really playful and some kind of whimsical. Uh, in Beethoven sonatas for piano, the fugues like in 101 is more of a struggle in the beauty of the struggling with the element and eventually some rubbing um, dissonances. Uh, in, one or, in 110, A-flat major, the fugue is an apotheosis of rising steps through melodic force, a bit like in A major subject of Book One in Bach, but in larger uh, values. And so, in a way, those fugues in Beethoven, for instance, examples um, for piano, are, or at least in the sonata, are um, in fact character pieces within the piece. And uh, they have a function that is emotional, intent, intellectual as well, of course, stimulating at all levels, an uplifting spirit. But um, in Bach, I think uh, it's more disincarnated from a character per se, although performing it at some point we do perhaps more than we should, but it's tempting in some phrasing with two slur, two staccato, or just seduction with a purpose, um, uh, not only for the purpose of seducing with the piece, um, uh, if I can say it also a certain way of uh, conveying um, the prettiness with the meaningful element that is in the art. So utilitarian uh, for the formal, but um, pretty for the, I guess, eye of the beholder definition of what it is to be pretty for the sake of it, or meanwhile it remains a beautiful form of um, a creation of the human brain with the human soul, of course. Art of the Fugue, uh, Fugues from uh, Bach's uh, musical offering, the famous Witcher Carr in six, the only six-voice fugue of Bach. Even if you contrast it with a two-voice fugue, the only for the well-tempered clavier E minor, book one, it's really an invention in that point. But nevertheless, he wrote a fugue in two voices, and he wrote a fugue in six voices, and all the others are in three and four, and few in five. But in general, no matter how many voices, in a way, Bach's music is um, organizing them such way that they're breathing. They're like, I like to say the <laughs> analogy with the um, fish tank and the fishes never colliding while close passing each other. And um, the voices in Bach's fugues no matter how extended leaps they have in intervals or dramatic effects of droppings or, or, or some uh, intervals that are diminished or, uh, or chromatic, like a diminished fourth, diminished third, and then avoidance of the leading tone reaching the tonic right away. All kinds of effects that bring the musical expression to a sense of uh, symbolism that even the Russian musicologist Yavorsky connected to different um, religious uh, symbolisms, uh, the cross uh, uh, with, uh, for instance, subject of C-sharp minor, book one in five voices, and um, or the repeated notes, um, the call of death, um, all kinds of symbolisms that added to the pure voice writing um, um, I don't think it's incompatible, therefore, with the pianistic quote-unquote interpretation and not just the pure music itself. And not necessarily separating the two, as if you separate the soul from the body or you separate the spirituality from the gymnastics of it. I think you find spirituality in everything you do. By the essence of ama, uh, uh, the soul, amare, love, anima, 
um, soul anime uh, movement uh, liveliness um, I find that all these are connected in the motion the liveliness of the motion and how the voices overlap interact and the fact that um, the pianist is confronted after playing pieces that don't have this um, genre and this texture um, and plays music okay can say that's for organ fugue or for harpsichord fugue or perhaps um, um, <coughs> sorry trio sonata fugue like in the um, musical offering evidently Bach's um, fugal writing was part of his essential expression a bit like Mozart for opera and Haydn Beethoven for quartet and Vivaldi for concerti and but they, of course what many other things I'm just saying that is not exclusive probably because on the organ the polyphony for Bach with the uh, lack of um, problem of decay that perhaps he could inevitably had not that it was considered as a problem, but it was just a different way to cope with it. Though he never made compromises for the length of sounds, writing a fugue in whole notes on the harpsichord for the well-tempered um, pedagogical uh, um, approach of Bach is always for the keyboard works, as well as the pure um, uh, complex and beauty of complexity in the choral works with the choral openings of his cantatas or um, the passions um, and the uh, fugal uh, elements there as well as naturally um, all the in fact everything in his writing is polyphonic and I think he thinks in layers um, he hears in layers he combines in layers gracefully the voices combine and sometimes uh, they have their own expression of emotional intensity and provoked dissonances and then soothing consonances um, we can put into it as I said earlier all our own innuendo in our playing of them displaying of them and I find it fascinating because it is not possible to hear it twice the same way almost even to the same performer no matter how much you rationalize the facts of the articulation and the tempi and the breathing and the counting even the subdivision the relation of the tempi the the way you organize um, the structural uh, demonstration of the whole texture um, the architectural presentation of the piece uh, the climax towards the stretto towards the end or perhaps with the dominant harmonic pedal before the end if you have the traditional succession of tonalities for the presentation of the thematic material with the, in major would be the tonic uh, then you have the relative minor then the subdominant and then the relative minor of the subdominant so if he was in C would be A, F, D and then dominant G for the dominant harmonic pedal and then you finish in the key of the tonic which would be C for the stretto and so you have a sense of busy build up um, stretto being narrow in Italian or um, um, you have a, the, the climax is the complexity of the overlapping elements and um, not necessarily the dynamic range but it can be also in the interpretation brought in to that dimension too it's not excluded and I think that pianists could have no um, and should not have any guilt using this aspect of the emotional um, uplifting emotional uplifting of the piano dynamic range as well articulations capacity or even middle pedal for separation of compartmentation let's say of a bass uh, ostinato held with other parts not to get confusing in the acoustics of church it does but in regular concert halls or even practice rooms you need clarity so you could use the middle pedal which of course then becomes doctoring the keyboard um, very playing which CPE in his uh, essay uh, describes so much in the expressive mode uh, and he's, after all, the second son of J.S. 
So there is forever for me, from my childhood, having studied them weekly and memorizing them with Mademoiselle Boulanger's lessons, um, they became not only the daily bread, as Schumann used to call the well-tempered clavier, but they became the necessity to develop through them, perhaps pedagogically Bach intended that too, um, to think everything polyphonic, not just the fugue and not this very one, but your own ones or the ones that you study from others, or copy other fugues to learn how to write your own, as he did himself as an orphan when he was uh, not having really proper teaching. Of course, within a given style, in a given area of the world, it's easier to uh, to circumscribe it from, let's say, writing an atonal fugue, if you were to, or, or model or combined. And so that's another dimension of the beyond the Baroque style, but already the fugues in the Romantic era uh, and um, or the fugal elements, at least in uh, Beethoven and um, Liszt, as I said earlier, or other composers like Brahms in the piano quintet, or Schumann even, um, this fascination with the idea that the fugue is sort of the supreme element of combining the thematic materials, even if they are in a symphonic or piano um, setting um, in terms of the fact that they are the thematic materials of a sonata form and not per se only the subject of a fugal form and um, the two can uh, combine quite well especially the piano has the capacity with the right foot pedal to hold even longer before the decay so for, for the capacity of those to, who can voice um, in uh, shadows and lights, you can um, adorn the subject or the answer with the contra subject in ways that you can follow both without them being per se combined. And perhaps ultimately I came to the conclusion after so many years of layering and um, wishfully and, and forcefully intellectually that sometimes the composer is writing close encounters of voices in interaction, possibly overlapping each other with the same hand on the piano or the keyboard, intended them to be, in fact, combining rather than only layered. And of course, didactically or in a certain way, uh, explicitly wanting to bring some clarity to, of the texture in, through your playing in a public setting, um, over voicing in a way is also um, over doctoring it. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to bring in your subjectivity within the objective, beautiful um, voice uh, exchanges um, and um, uh, flourishing uh, elements. I mean, I feel like we are constantly afraid to do something wrong because we are outside of the time period in which it was written. We don't play it per se, all of us, the instrument for which it was written. But do we have the hearing for which, when it was written, of the music, the pitch, the intonation, the, uh, the tuning, um, the type of intervals that were privileged, like the major thirds versus the unisons only with the well-tempered onwards but then the chromaticism that it allowed to explore even more the color, literally colorization, since that's what chroma is in Greek, color. Um, all this is, um, it seems to me like um, we are in a way children all of a father of fugue that would be Bach and of course Buxtehude and predecessors before him Frescobaldi and so many, and that um, it was uh, through the Renaissance with the motets and through the uh, capacity to even write up to 40 voices, virtuosity was not always, of course, as we accept it pianistically today, as a digital feast only. It was also the layered feast of the voices and the feat to make them coexist and collaborate and um, in fact, to highlight each other. I find that fascinatingly beautiful because in a way, um, 
it, it, it liberates our brain even in places where pieces are written with a melody and an accompaniment. We can still voice the accompaniment. We can shape it in a sculptural way. Or any texture we play on the piano. Uh, is it necessary or is it just a stylistic attempt or is it a desire to be original for the sake of it? Perhaps a bit of all. But nevertheless, I think um, I'm convinced actually that um, thinking, writing, copying, playing, memorizing a fugue by layers and playing it together, um, all together as written, um, ultimately is a magnificent challenge for the, for the brain and for the soul. And I'm very thankful that I was given a chance by Mademoiselle Boulanger as a seven-year-old to do one a week in this um, capacity of melodic understanding, then harmonic progressions, understanding of it, and then while copying, realizing how the voices go, and I had to copy it in the clefs, uh, the ancient clefs in the staves, and then play it from the score that I wrote with the in inevitable mistakes. Uh, but um, the idea was to appropriate the text until you serve it the most honestly. But not only because you recite it from the given page, but because you took the time. And that is the possibly most difficult thing to find today, is the time to go through this process in order to um, beautifully in let the music infuse in you. And then, like they say, for people in love, they complete each other's sentence. I would say that, in a way, that's how I hear the voices in a fugue. They complete each other's sentence, the voices. It's some kind of a giant puzzle of sentences that emerges like some kind of a elevated truth, uh, spiritually, from all these voices. Yeah, at so many levels, it's philosophical, and it's uh, emotional, and it's cerebral, and it's uh, challenging for the um, display on the keyboard. And the flow of all the tracks at the same time, and the follow-up of them, and the anticipation of them as well, not only following them, as a listener, but actively also as a performer, becoming a performer listener plus because you play but you also listen you're immersed it's a it's a beautiful thing to teach fugues i find it so stimulating and uh, when i see how beautifully and differently um, the minds and souls of the students who apply this um, process um, bring them to be so enthused, in fact, about playing it. Not discouraged or by the tedious aspect of writing from memory, voice by voice on a score, and um, struggling to remember what comes next, because inevitably there are the details, but the whole is not only the sum of the details. While it is full of details, but then it's all with a determination of an arrival point for each sentence, of each phrase, of each line. I find it fascinating to see how then when they play it, it becomes their own piece and they play it in a way differently from, of course, the way I would, or that's not the purpose, to make them duplicate my way. But uh, as a teacher, I mean, but as a performer, I do my own hearing and I evolve in my hearing of the piece with time because that's what it is. You always can discover more in uh, what is there as it keeps a given giving gift. But ultimately, is the beauty of discovering how young people place their own new vision of these pieces which ancestors before us discovered and, and predecessors, therefore, followers will continue doing too after us. But it will mean always for them something like a personal encounter with a certain truth.